What's up you guys and welcome to another Hollow Week video. So today's video we are talking about a man named Todd Guy that his death is basically up for speculation, I guess you could say. There's not a lot of information on him and the whole reason I even found him to begin with is I wanted to cover something on Hollow Week that involved bizarre phone calls. I was gonna do Henry McKay, but that's been done so many times and we know me, I wanna bring light to something that's not been spoken about much before. And I ended up finding Todd Guy and the circumstances of his death are like the strangest thing I think I've ever seen. And it also connects with a theory of a serial killer that you guys have been asking me to speak about for a really long time, but I haven't because I'm really on the fence about it. So pretty much the only reason I have any information in this case, and there's not a lot of it, is because Oxygen did a little series at one point called the Smiley Face series. So that's kind of given you guys a look into one of the things I'm going to be talking about in this. Um, he was, I think, season one, episode six in the series. And this is all the information I could really find out there other than really small articles. So this definitely isn't gonna be a long video, but I just feel so drawn to help his mom fight for information. And you will feel the exact same way after viewing this video. So Todd Geib was a deeply loved young man. He just looks like your average nice guy. He was known for his friendly disposition. He was smart. He was athletic. He was always up to have a good time. And he was the biggest family man, but he was taken from his family on June 12th, 2005 at only 22 years old. Despite being a seemingly simple case with very few details, the details make absolutely no sense and sound crazy. The community of Casnovia, Michigan, where he was found deceased and Todd's family have spent years trying to understand what actually happened and kind of walking on eggshells, scared about someone possibly in their community. And Kathy, his mom has been fighting so hard for authorities to take a second look. So now let's just jump into the circumstances. At the time of his death, Todd was renting a room from his cousin near Half Moon Lake in Casnobia, Michigan. The community had a tiny population, like to the point where I triple checked it because I'm like, there's no way this is real. There were only 314 people living in Casnobia at the time of the death. Now, this was obviously because of this, a place where everyone knew everyone, but I guess it also seemed like a place that a lot of people flocked to younger, you know, kids for parties and, you know, things like that. And it was also kind of situated in an area where you could get to a lot of other larger big cities in Michigan. And on the night of June 11th, 2005, Todd was going to have a fun night. I believe it was a Saturday night. He went to a bar named the Kaz in downtown Casnovia. And then from there, he went with a friend to an orchard party. Now the party was only about a mile or so away from where he was staying at his cousin's house. And it was supposed to be a guaranteed good night. They knew how to throw parties. Again, in a giant orchard in the middle of the summer, there was a keg, there was gonna be a bonfire, and there were going to be a lot of people. About 100 people showed up to this party. And for a town that has a population of 314, uh, I'm gonna say that's a lot of freaking people. It was in a very, very remote location. You had to get off of 37, which was I guess like the main highway, if you even wanna call it that, through Casnovia. You had to get off there onto a dirt road that from what I've seen is literally just called <laughs> dirt road. And you had to go down that and then drive down a driveway, which they called like a two track because you just saw like the two wheels. So these orchard parties were also called like two track parties. I hope I'm getting all of this right. But either way, it was in the middle of nowhere. It was private property that this party was on. I, I'm assuming strangers wouldn't just stumble into this. So you had to know someone who knew someone or have been invited basically in order to even find this party. Now, I don't know much about the party itself, which kind of has me feeling strange. But again, I'm working with the details that I could find. But I just know Todd had a few drinks while he was there. I'm also assuming he had a few drinks when he went to the Kaz, that bar in downtown Casanova. Uh, but there were reports from people at the party that claimed he was not by any means or stretch of the imagination overly intoxicated. A little after midnight, Todd decided to head home. 
and he left kind of abruptly. And this is again why I'm so irritated that I don't know more about the party because I feel like that's where a lot of the answers lie. Now, I don't know if he just wanted to call it a night or if something happened and he was pissed and wanted to leave, but he headed off on foot despite, you know, having come with a ride and had originally planned on leaving with the same ride. It was only about a mile to get to his house, so no one really questioned the fact that he decided to leave on foot and they weren't really concerned because he wasn't overly intoxicated, but then very strange phone calls started to happen. At 12.47, Todd called the friend that he arrived at the party with, the ride he was supposed to leave with, and said he'd had enough. Now, I have no idea in what context that was in. I don't know if it was like he had enough, like I'm pissed, I've had enough of this, I need to leave, or I've just had enough of partying, I don't feel well, I've gotta go home. But either way, he left fast enough to where he didn't even tell this person face to face, he had to call them. So then he made another call to a friend at 1251, just minutes later, saying that he was in the middle of a field. Now I've seen his exact words were, I'm in a field, but I've also seen a few different reports that made it seem like he was saying he was lost in a field. I've at this point shown a map of the area. I can see how someone would get in the middle of a field and potentially lost. Before the friend could really ask any more questions, the phone call cut off. This friend tried to call Todd back in hopes of figuring out what was going on, but when he did answer, all they heard was either heavy breathing or the sound of wind kind of whipping against the phone. After this, from what I understand, Todd repeatedly called this friend back, but the attempts stopped at 12.57. It should have been a fairly easy walk to get home, but Todd never made it there. Authorities were notified that Todd was missing and given the events of the night and the really rural location, a massive search ensued. They checked his phone and it hadn't been used since his call at 1257. And they also checked his cards in case maybe he ended up riding off with someone and spent money somewhere, but there was no activity on those either. They checked along the route that he would have taken to go home and nothing. They checked where the party was and still nothing. I think in total over 1,500 volunteers volunteers and officers showed up to assist in the search. They even brought out different types of aircraft to try to see if they could find him. I don't know if thermal was used or anything like that, but I'm assuming maybe, maybe they were just trying to spot him from up high, possibly in a field, but either way, they didn't find anything. No sign of Todd whatsoever. So they decided to bring in cadaver dogs to maybe see if they could narrow down the direction that he went in and it appeared he was going in the right direction home. They tracked his scent from the party down the two track road. They got to the dirt road. He turned the right direction, and but the dogs lost his scent as soon as the dirt road hit 37, the paved road, the main road he would have had to get on to finish his walk home. This didn't make sense because this meant he made it all the way to the main road. From there on, the walk home would have been easy, but his call made it seem like he was lost in a field it just didn't make sense because did he make his way out of the field and then, you know, something happened after that? Authorities tried to think of pretty much any other explanation as to what could have happened to him. Maybe he was picked up on 37, but they had absolutely no evidence at all. Todd had literally dropped off the face of the earth until 21 days later. On July 2nd, 2005, a man and his wife were walking around Ovidal Lake. Now, there's the orchard right here. Again, I'll have a picture up. And then Ovidal Lake was a private lake on this property a little bit further north. It was the closest body of water that he would have come to. Now, the lake itself, again, was a private lake. There are no public accesses. There are quite a few properties surrounding it that kind of back up to it. And I'm assuming the wife and husband that were walking around the lake were likely one of the people that lived in a surrounding home. Now, as they were walking around the lake, the wife noticed something in the water that she believed to originally be a beaver. And she pointed it out to her husband, you know, hey, look, there's a beaver. And he looked at it and said, I don't think that's a beaver. It wasn't moving and when he took a closer look, he suddenly remembered Todd was still missing and he was pretty sure they had just found a body. Authorities arrived and sure enough, they found Todd's body and the water, but everything about this situation from start to finish didn't add up. The man and his wife that found Todd had also noticed a few strange things 
on their walk around the lake that day. They typically had a canoe tied up at one end of the lake, but when they went to where the canoe was, the canoe was completely gone. And this was a private lake. People didn't typically get into this lake unless they lived in that area. It ended up later being found on the other side of the lake filled with beer cans. His brother and nephew had also been on the lake just the night before. I think they did some late night fishing. They were there until nine, but keep in mind this is summer. The sun didn't go down until probably right around nine and they didn't see anything. When you fish on that particular lake, he said that you would typically fish around the outer edges of the lake. Uh, and that's kind of in the same location Todd's body was. So if he had been in there, they kind of expected that he would have been seen. Now, granted, if a body is in the water, if someone drowns in the water, their body can be underwater until their body fills with gas and then lifts them up. Maybe he had just surfaced. But the strangest thing about this body was that, I'm sure at this point you guys know what a body typically looks like. They are typically floating face down in the water it appeared as if Todd was standing in the water. And that is not common unless usually you are weighted down by something. The second I heard that, the hair on the back of my neck stood up and I could not believe that. I personally, granted I'm not a professional, I don't constantly recover bodies from water, but I don't think I've ever seen a circumstance where a body has been found in an upright position in the water. I would love for you guys to let me know if you've seen any examples of that. Let me know down in the comments below, but it was bizarre. Todd was fully clothed. His wallet was still in his pocket. I've seen no mention at all of the phone, so I'm assuming the phone was not with him. Um, I don't think it's been found anywhere in the area. And despite appearing again to be standing in the water, there was absolutely no evidence whatsoever that he had been anchored down. There was no evidence of ligatures on his body. Um, my brain personally went to maybe his feet got stuck in the mud or something, but his shoes didn't appear to be caked with mud. And after his body was taken for an autopsy, it got even weirder. Todd had no water at all in his lungs. If you are a drowning victim, again, I'm not a professional, don't attack me in the comments, you're gonna have water in your lungs. Usually, if there's no water in your lungs, that means you went into that water already dead. His decomposition was also a huge issue. He was only intermediately decomposed. If you have been in hot summer lake water for 21 days, your body's decomposition I mean, it's gonna happen pretty quickly. Decomposition slows down when it's colder and you know, things like that. This is hot, humid, muggy, water, bugs, all sorts of things. He also had a blood alcohol level of 0.12, which not too surprising he was drinking that night, but the medications they found in his system, that was something that was not expected. He had, and I'm gonna have to look down to read these because I can't even say them while reading them properly, desipramine and amitriptyline, I think I said those right. He had both of those in his system and both of those drugs are used for depression. Todd was not diagnosed as being depressed. He was not prescribed any of these medications and they're not recreational drugs. Todd, first of all, was not known to even use drugs or even experiment with drugs. And if he had decided to, chances are he's not going to randomly decide to take two drugs not known for being used recreationally. And when it comes to these two drugs in general, they're usually never even prescribed at the same time anyways. They're drugs from the exact same class. They pretty much do the exact same thing. It would be like double dosing on like Tylenol and off-brand Tylenol, essentially. You're just doubling that up and that can cause a whole heck of a lot of problems for someone taking the medication. If you were to double up this medicine and at the levels that it was in his body, he would have gone down in an hour with the amount he had consumed. He would have started to suffer from confusion. He would have started to hallucinate. I'm talking seizures are possible, cardiac arrest. However, there was no evidence of that in the autopsy. It would have been bad within an hour of taking this medication. They couldn't figure out why on earth this would have been in his system. And there were still other things that didn't add up. The owner of the property said that in order to get from the party to the lake, he would have had to cross through basically an impassable 
forest of thorn bushes, like two inch thorns all over the place, thigh to waist high. No one could pretty much get through that. If they did, they would come out covered in deep gashes and scratches and it would have been an, a near impossible task to get through it. But there was absolutely no sign on his body at all that he walked through any sort of thorns. So how on earth did he end up in this lake? Now this is where I get really frustrated and where pretty much everyone gets really, really pissed. Despite all of that information, which I understand it's sometimes hard to rule a case. You have to go with what's in front of you. There might be like one questionable thing, but it could have an explanation, but that is just a whole bunch of questionable nonsense. But authorities deemed this as an accidental drowning. Problem number one, there was no water in his lungs. The case was pretty much never looked at as anything but an accidental drowning. No one really agreed with the classification, but it didn't seem authorities really cared much. And Todd's mom, Kathy, flipped out. She knew something was wrong. She had seen the recovery photos. And even as just a regular civilian with no training, she knew after seeing the pictures, there was no way his body had been in the water for 21 days. She knew this was not an accident and she was going to get to the bottom of it. After years of trying to get someone to listen, in 2009, a board certified forensic pathologist agreed to look over the recovery photos and the autopsy. He brought all of this information to his team and to other investigators. And after looking into it, they all agreed, every single one of them, with what Kathy had been saying for years at this point. Based on their own evaluation, they believed there was no way Todd had been dead for longer than two to five days when his body was found. So where was he for the other 15 some days? But despite bringing this information forward to authorities, authorities still refused to reopen the case. She began doing more research on her own and she ended up stumbling across an idea of a serial killer the smiley face killer. Now, this is kind of where I'll dig into this. Now, I have been asked repeatedly to talk about the smiley face killer, go over, you know, all the possible victims, but I have personally looked into probably three cases thought to be linked, and I just, I don't know, I just am not convinced it's a thing. But this is probably one of the cases where I think there is a possibility. And so that's why I'm kind of dragging the smiley face killer into this. So if you're not idea of what this theory is, it was created by two New York City detectives, Kevin Gannon and Anthony Duarte. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. But alongside them, there was also a criminal justice professor named Dr. Lee Gilbertson. So basically what started this is that there is a absurdly large amount of young men that have gone missing and then turned up dead in a body of water across all kinds of states. I believe more specifically in the Midwest. I could be wrong on that. Um, it started in the late 90s and then it's gone on until now. Now there are a lot of similarities between a lot of these men. They are all typically Caucasian males. They are always usually very fit, uh, very smart. They go to school, they get good grades, uh, very popular, but they almost always go missing after a night of drinking, after a night of partying. And typically, again, they end up in a body of water, but the times never match up. Usually the amount of time they've been in the water does not match up with the amount of time that they have been missing. And then why it received the name of the smiley face killings, or the smiley face killer, is that there's always usually a smiley face spray painted somewhere on something around where the body is found. Now, this is a very controversial theory. A lot of people completely <laughs> disagree with Gannon and Duarte's finds. They think that they are just kind of like washed up old cops that don't know what they're doing. Uh, but there are a lot of people that strongly, strongly believe this. But again, a lot of people think, you know, you pair alcohol and bodies of water and young men, that's bound to create more problems. Um, and then a smiley face is something that is really common, so it's not that strange to see a smiley face graffitied everywhere. Uh, so a lot of people believe it's just a coincidence. However, these detectives strongly, strongly believe that there really is a killer out there targeting this very specific group of young men. 
They believe that these males are abducted and then drugged or drugged and then abducted. I couldn't quite figure that out. And then they're held for a short period of time before being killed and thrown into a body of water. Now I've seen that some of these men are badly beaten and have other injuries on them while others, it just appears they were thrown in. And Kathy strongly believed as well that her son could possibly be one of these victims. When Todd's body was found, and keep in mind this location, multiple people saw a smiley face graffitied on a tree on the edge of the lake, right near his body. And then on top of that, a smiley face like card or something was found on his grave. Their goal was to basically come out, look into this case and present whatever they found to authorities and hopefully have it reopened because that's essentially kind of what they do at this point. They're trying to work with families because all of these cases are typically deemed a suicide or an accidental drowning and they want it reopened. They want evidence, you know, rechecked. They immediately saw all the things that didn't add up. The fact that the decomp wasn't nearly at the level that they believed it should have been at. Um, and they also found a couple of other things. If he had been in the water for 21 days, there would be insects on his body or, you know, sand, debris, certain things, algae growing, biofilm, covering his body from being in the water for an extended period of time, but nothing like that was documented in his autopsy. And they couldn't figure out if it was just because it just wasn't documented or if because it wasn't actually there. But once they really took a good look at the pictures, it didn't appear like he had any algae on him. It didn't appear he had any insects on him. It wasn't adding up. So they decided to take this to another expert. They took Todd's case to Dr. Eric Bimbo, a forensic entomologist, and they were hoping he could answer some of their questions. He immediately was shocked that the body was at such a intermediate stage of decomposition. And he was even more so shocked that there were no insects on Todd. The way he was found kind of standing up, he had his shoulder and his head out of the water. Even his mouth was kind of out of the water. And Dr. Bimbo expected to see lots and lots of insect in the folds of his skin, places like behind his ear, in his ear, um, like right where his collar would have met his neck, inside of his mouth even, which is terrifying, but it's just a reality. And he just wasn't seeing it. So he decided to take a trip to the lake to maybe see if there's just not a large insect population, but he immediately found evidence that really made that completely go out the window. When he arrived at the lake, one of the first things he found was evidence of a lot of predatory insects and where there's predators, there's prey, meaning there were insects all over this entire lake. Based on what he saw, he was shocked Todd's body hadn't been fully colonized by some sort of insect at this point. Kathy had all of the clothing that Todd had been wearing when his body was found and she handed this over to Dr. Bimbo and a bunch of experiments and tests began. One of the largest and most important tests was to see what would happen to a similar body after 21 days of being in the water in very similar conditions. And the best way to do this was using a pig carcass. Pig carcasses decompose at a very similar rate to a human body and in very, and in very similar ways. So they took these five pig carcasses and they fully dressed them in similar clothing that Todd had been wearing at the time, and they placed them all in a lake with very similar conditions. Now, they didn't place it in the exact lake Todd was in, which in my personal opinion would drastically change it, but I guess being scientists, they knew what they were doing and they put it in the right location to match enough. And they took samples from three of these pigs every other day to see what was happening with them, and then the other two they just let sit, which would have been exactly what was going on with Todd. They found some very disturbing things. And uh, there is a time lapse of what happens to these pigs on the Oxygen series. And I don't think I've ever been so disturbed watching something before probably in my entire life. And I look into cases like this all the time, watching what happened because of the bugs and decomposition just be very aware of that if you go on and end up watching this episode. So by the first day, the pig carcasses started to bloat and on the first day, guess what? There were signs of insects and not just even a few insects. There were pictures being taken, time-lapse pictures. You could see the bugs on the body already. By day three, not just insects were on the body, but there was larva. And from there on, it basically went from zero to 100 incredibly quick. You couldn't even see the pig's 
carcass really anymore. Uh, it was unrecognizable. I don't think I've ever seen that many maggots and insects in my life. The body was foaming essentially. And by 21 days, the body had fully collapsed in on itself from the decomposition, the heat, and all of the bugs living off of the carcass. So at this point, they determined there was no way Todd had been in that lake for more than about three days, which matches the two to five days that the other and that the other experts said. Benbo did, however, state there was another side to this, and a few things could in fact change this that would make sense for the state in which Todd's body was found. As we all know, if you drown, if you're thrown into a body of water and you are no longer alive, you will sink. But eventually, the gas again will build up in your body and bring you back to the surface. However, a lot of things come into play when it comes to how fast the body will come up. If he had been at a deeper part in the lake where the temperature was a lot cooler, it would have taken him a lot longer to rise up. And there also would have been a lot less aquatic insects. So he believed it was potentially possible that maybe he was just submerged in a deeper part of the lake and had just recently come up, which would explain why there weren't any bugs or anything like that. But even that being said, the temperature would have still brought his body up more than likely a lot faster than just 21 days. And again, if he had been down in the depths of that water that long, you'd expect to see sand, you'd expect to see debris, and there was nothing. They brought all of their findings to authorities and the authorities basically completely shot them down. Despite all of this information, multiple scientists looking into this, multiple different experiments done, they said there was absolutely no evidence that had been brought to them that made them feel like they needed to reopen the case or suspect foul play at all. So yet again, Todd's family was left to figure out what on earth happened and beg for authorities to take them seriously, but were just being shot down left and right. So this kind of brings us to theories. And I think what's so frustrating is that there's so much more than just what was found in the most recent studies and experiments that make this seem suspicious. And the fact that authorities just are ignoring every single thing that's brought to them is really infuriating. I feel like this is really just being written off as, oh, he was drunk and did drugs and then he died from it. And that's that, it was an accidental drowning. But to me, that's not taking into account pretty much 95% of the information that they have. Now, again, there's a huge belief that he's a victim of the smiley face killer. I don't know how to feel about this with this one. I'm already very on the fence with the whole smiley face killer idea anyways. But this is probably one where I am kind of sitting back and taking everything in and thinking it through because what are the chances in... A a tiny town like Casnovia in the middle of Michigan with a population of 314, there just so happens to be a smiley face graffitied on a tree in a private area on a private lake that you can't really have a lot of access to beside a body that fits the description of the smiley face killings. Like to me, <clears throat> I don't know what to think, but I do believe there are multiple other explanations as to what might've happened. The drugs to me, are huge because these are prescription drugs. They are not recreational drugs, meaning chances are very high that this wasn't just a drug that someone bought off of someone and decided to drug someone with. Someone used their own medications to put these drugs in him. If it's believed that he died only two to five days before being put into the water, then that means he was being drugged likely from the time he left the party and was possibly taken up until the point in which he died. Since he had no ligature marks, it to me makes sense that someone would drug him with something that would make him confused and hallucinate and basically unable to move or do pretty much anything. This would be an easy way to gain control over him until he was killed. But my question is why? Why would someone have done that to him? Because from what I've seen, he didn't have many enemies. Uh, he seemed like a really nice, calm guy. He didn't involve himself in anything bad. Was he drugged at the party and then followed potentially when he left? He did seem to be showing some possible signs 
of the side effects he would have been experiencing with this amount of medication in his system. He claimed to be lost in a field. He, you know, completely left. He seemed confused, possibly agitated. I honestly wish authorities had taken two seconds, which they might've done. I don't know for a fact that they haven't to create a list of party goers and just simply see if anyone at that party had been prescribed those two kinds of medications. This was a keg party. If he was on someone's bad side or someone wanted to do something to him, he was drinking probably out of a solo cup. It would take two seconds and be easy as crap to drug someone's drink. Some people believe it was possible that he really did just leave the party just to leave the party and then maybe he ended up running into the wrong person on 37, drugged, held hostage by this person and then potentially dumped in a location close to where he was taken. That to me doesn't seem as likely Half Moon Lake is literally a hop skip jump away from 37. You can see it from 37, at least from what I can tell off of Google Maps. If you wanted to dump a body near the last place the person was seen, I would assume they would have dumped him there. Um, I don't think anyone would have known about Ovidal Lake without living locally or living in those outskirting houses or being someone at the party, which leads me to believe that it was definitely someone local. This is kind of what brings me away from the smiley face theory because this was such a secluded location. Keep in mind 2005, there's like map quest. This lake was hidden by trees. It was difficult to get to. You would have either had to park on the side of basically 37 and walk a body through the woods to get to the water, or you would have had to walk through someone's property and that's really, really risky. Plus, if someone had taken him, held him hostage at another location, it's just too risky in general to transport that person somewhere else, potentially farther away. I honestly believe if someone did this to him, it's someone so close in that vicinity, lives in that area, uh, really close by. I cannot figure out why his body would have been in the position that it was, kind of standing up. I really wish they would have had a professional voice their opinion on this. I don't know what circumstances would have to happen to where a body would be positioned like that. There could be an explanation for it. I just personally haven't seen one. I also don't know the depth of the water he was found in because I again keep being brought back to the idea maybe his feet were stuck in the mud and that's why he was in that position. But one thing I do know is that lack of water in his lungs to me says he did not drown. He was thrown in the water already dead and it's really disappointing to me that authorities will not take another look into this case. It's like it's so much easier for them to assume and throw this to the side as being an accidental drowning than to actually do the footwork necessary to figure out what really happened. And I feel horrible for Todd's family and how bad they've been fighting to have someone listen to them this entire time. At this point, I don't even know what it would take to finally get authorities to look into this case. I think Hands would have to change over at some point. Someone new is gonna have to come in. Pressure's gonna need to be put on them to actually look into this. I really hope people that were at the party that night think about those around them. Think about the people that went. Did they know anybody that had those medications? Um, I strongly believe it's more likely someone at the party was involved in this than anyone else, or at least someone around in the area. Maybe did he walk onto the wrong property and piss someone off, but again, being such a small community, everyone seemed to know everyone, so I don't know how likely that is. Let me know what you guys think down below. Do you believe it's this smiley face killer that just so happened to find their way to a random small party in a tiny town? Or do you think it was someone at the party? Do you think it was someone in the community? Was he taken on 37? Was this really just some sort of accident and maybe he just ended up in the water afterwards. Let me know what you think down below. Leave some encouraging comments for his family as well because I know they're still fighting so hard to keep exposure out there about his story. They've held a couple of different events to try to keep it out in the community, but that's it for today's video. I wanna thank you guys so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to Todd's story and support his family. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button so we can hopefully bring them home together and I will see you guys tomorrow for another Halloween video. Bye.